Hello, my name is Stefan Burns, and welcome to this Passive Seismic webinar. I'm a geophysicist with Geometrics, and Geometrics is a manufacturer of geophysical equipment, namely seismographs, magnetometers, and geoelectrical devices. Geometrics was founded in 1969. This Passive Seismic webinar specifically will be looking at deep shear wave velocity data, or deep VS data, and how you can collect that using the atom seismograph. So let's dive right in. First, let's just do a little bit of background and what are surface waves? This is what the atom seismograph collects. And we'll talk about the atom in the next slide. And there's three types of seismic waves. You have P waves, S waves, and surface waves. And surface waves travel along, as you can tell, along the surface. Uh, P waves are compressional waves and S waves are shear waves. And when we look at engineering uh, and structural foundational stuff uh, where we're concerned about how a, let's say, a site or a building will respond to an earthquake, we're interested in the shear wave properties. So with passive seismic, though, you're really measuring surface waves. Surface waves make up about 70% of all the seismic energy, um, let's say, that's released during a, an impact or if you were to swing a sledgehammer on the ground. Most of that seismic energy release will be surface waves. And the ambient micro tremors that are propagating through the earth everywhere at once, all the time, those are surface waves that we're measuring, uh, primarily. They're the highest amplitude waves. So they're the ones that, if you were to have a surface wave and a shear wave coming at the same time to the geophone, the surface wave will be stronger and will outgain the shear wave. So we use surface waves or passive seismic, and then we convert them to shear waves using some known equations. So after the surface wave data has been processed and the dispersion curve has been created, then frequency can be transformed into depth for the final shear wave velocity model, which plots shear wave velocity versus depth. You can take that frequency and transform it into depth using the one-third wavelength theory and this is a numerical and experimental rule that phase velocity generally represents the S wave velocity at a depth of roughly a half to a third of the wavelength. So it's a rough approximation like apparent resistivity uh, used to make an initial model of inversion which can then be iterated upon and it's it's fairly accurate. We When we look at um, passive seismic methods in terms of generating shear wave velocity profiles, and we compare that to, let's say, like cross hole or downhole surveys, or you compare that to a borehole log or a CPT cone, uh, cone testing, cone, petrom cone petrometer testing. We find that all these methods are fairly equivalent in their accuracy of uh, quantifying the subsurface. So. The benefit though to passive seismic methods is that it doesn't require, it's completely non-invasive, it doesn't require any drilling uh, like let's say cross hole mite, and it's fairly easy to uh, collect and also process, whereas other methods are a little bit more complicated and time consuming. So passive seismic methods are really great for quantifying the shear wave properties of the subsurface. When it comes to deep VS data, we're, we're concerned about collecting these naturally occurring micro tremors because that's the best source of the low frequency, uh, long period, long wavelength information that we need to collect data at depth and to make these observations. So artificial sources of low frequency uh, energy are, are impractical for deep VS studies often uh, that's not always the case. You could have a very large survey and set off explosives. That's what the U USGS often does. But for the purpose of the atom seismograph, it's able to collect deep VS data completely non-invasively and non-destructively and completely passively. So this is the, the Geometrics atom seismograph, and there's two different types. There's the atom 3C, which is the one shown here. It's an orange box. It has a three component geophone that attaches to it, and it is able to, as a result, handle uh, 
three channels of information at once, most typically with the 3C Geophone X, Y, and Z. And that also lets you do HVSR, which is horizontal over vertical spectral ratio uh, processing, which is uh, a very useful seismic processing technique. And the yellow box is our Atom 1C, that's a one channel or one component, most typically used with vertical geophones, but you can also attach a horizontal geophone. Our Atom seismographs are the receivers independent of the geophone. So it's a nodal seismograph, no spread cables required, has its own battery. The orange one lasts for 50 hours, the yellow one lasts for 70 and you can swap out the G-phones, which is really nice. So you can put in different frequencies, different orientations, all that stuff. One of the benefits of the Atom is that it has this long, long battery life of 50 to 70 hours. So in the context of owning this equipment for five, 10 or 15 years, it has a long enough battery life that when it does uh, over time mm, uh, reduce, you still have uh, a unit that could be used in the field an entire day with plenty of wiggle room. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with having a cell phone or a laptop that after a few years, it needs to stay plugged in to be usable. It needs to be on charge. Uh, so we've designed these to be used for a very long time. Uh, they're very, very rugged. They have a built-in GPS, so you can use them for, uh, the, you can use the built-in GPS for positioning data, which is awesome, especially when in context of the deep VS surveys, because you'll have to spread these out quite a lot. And you would not, it, it's very difficult to do a deep VS survey or and collect that type of information over a very large area with a spread cable system. So the nodal seismographs like the Atom are really excellent for that. And one of the reasons I'm giving this talk today. Um, they're expandable. You can bring a whole bunch of them, bring a few of them. They just order themselves based off serial number and you can deploy them all with just one person in the field. Uh, we will be talking a lot about the Napa Valley Seismic Project in this webinar. This is a project that I started in Napa, California back in the summer of 2020, and I've collected most of this data by myself using various atom configurations. Um, seven atoms at a time, 10, 16, I think 19 at one point. Um, We've also, like, we did a survey, a group of us did a survey with like 30 of them or so. So you can uh, deploy atoms really easily just as a single person, as a single field technician, or you can assemble a larger team and be a little bit more efficient that way. And that's important because when you're planning your deep VS survey, there's certain things you need to keep in mind. Uh, you want to be mindful of your noise sources. Are you next to a busy road? Uh, maybe there's construction nearby. Are, is there gonna be a lot of foot traffic? Or maybe uh, you're at a dog park like here. This, this uh, photo here, field layout, is from N38D, which we'll see a velocity model of at the very end. And you can see that there's uh, these walking paths there. This is on the west side, northwest side of Napa, and it's a dog park. So people have their dogs there, they go hiking, it's a great place. Um, so you wanna make sure your atoms are set up away from these harmful noise sources because uh, while the atom is collecting data continuously for let's say 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, for a deep VS survey, it's probably more like 90 minutes. Uh, any, any, any noise that hits that atom for any length of time does overall reduce the data quality. So you wanna make sure that it's overall for the most part unobstructed. We do have the ability in size imager SW to cancel out noise blocks, or you could choose like a the 60 second section, you cancel it out. Let's say a big 18 wheeler drove by or something. You're not gonna want that data, that noise in your data. So uh, other considerations would be the the geomorphological features, so the, the terrain, the topography. Uh, here we can see the, the vineyards, these are all vineyards, so you can see how big this area is. That's a big water tank, two big water tanks, 500 meters from there to there. That's a 500 meter, um, roughly. So uh, this is a large area, and off to the north here, you actually have um, hills that start to rise in elevation. So you wanna keep your atoms when doing a deep VS survey, really any passive seismic survey ideally is on level ground. So 
I do my best to keep them all within about three meters plus or minus of each other. So that's what uh, influenced this survey layout here. I wanted to get a really good footprint over this area. I wasn't able to lay them out in these vineyards because that's all private property and fenced and everything, but I was able to get them laid out on fairly flat ground relative to each other uh, across this area while also keeping them away from this main walking path. So things like um, hills, wetlands, creeks, rivers, all that stuff, make sure that you take that all into account with your, your survey planning and do your best to uh, design a survey that's gonna accurately catch, capture and quantify the features of interest. Um, Keep your survey surroundings in mind. And your goal is to create a really big footprint across the, the flat usable area. A, a single line survey geometry can uh, get you some really good data. And the differences between a, a line and let's say like a circular geometry or a square, something that's a little bit more 2D in shape, has more width to it. It isn't the most dramatic, but there are differences. So if you can, you always want to try to create a 2D survey geometry first and foremost um, over something that's really linear. So in this case, this is almost kind of like a parallelogram. Um, over here, it started to go down. So this is a pretty nice 2D geometry though, spread out over a large area and also kind of out of sight and away from foot traffic. So. This was a nice survey, I did all myself, took about two and a half, three hours, and got data to 850 meters with that. So it's really incredible what the Atom is capable of when you know how to use it and you start to have some experience with designing, planning, and collecting data for these deep BS surveys. So this is an example of how you wanna create a large footprint with your survey, specifically for uh, the deep VS surveys. It's really important with that. Uh, this is two dispersion curves, and they're at the same site. I was at a marsh in the, the hills of Browns Valley, which is um, to the west, the west side of Napa. And this marsh was fairly circular, so I did one line, I, I did a Fibonacci line which is a, a type of survey geometry using the Fibonacci sequence, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21. Just, you could uh, watch my video here to learn more about the Fibonacci sequence and, and why that's good for survey geometry. And so I laid out one Fibonacci line um, going vertically uh, along the marsh and I laid out the other Fibonacci line perpendicular to the first and going across the width of the marsh. So, you can see here there are differences. If you're looking to accurately quantify site, you want to do your best to capture that full 2D footprint. And the two survey methodology I used for that uh, place worked really well. Now, if you were just to get one of these, uh, overall, like these are still fairly similar dispersion curves. Um, your end goal with this survey what I did was I actually averaged these two. So I averaged them together and that's what I uploaded to sizeimager.com for the Napa Valley Seismic Project. Overall, these are fairly comparable, but if you are looking to get the best passive seismic data, then you want that full 2D footprint and this, these two dispersion curves just illustrate why. So let's talk a little bit more about survey geometry and uh, why, like how you actually collect deep VS data so we're, deep VS data is shear wave data beyond, let's say, 100 meters. The, the typical industry standard is to get a VS30, or a shear wave average for the top 30 meters. And you use this for uh, site classifications and for determining how robust you need to build a structure for a building or how you need to retrofit it or what have you. Um, if you're going to be getting data to a kilometer or 1500 meters or 500 meters or any of these uh, pretty deep uh, deep surveys, then you need to have a plan in place. And you wanna make sure you get good data through that entire swath, all the way from zero to 500 or zero to 1200 meters. Um, it's typically easiest to do that with multiple surveys. Depending on how many atoms you have will be the, the real determining factor. So. 
if you have 10 atoms or 12 atoms, then you'll probably need to do multiple surveys. If you have 50 atoms, well, then you could set up a small survey, a medium and a large survey and collect the data all at once. And that would be ideal. But it depends on how many atoms you have. N18D uh, is a deep VS survey we did in Napa along the west side of the Napa uh, basin. And we did three, three or more surveys at, Na at Harvest Middle School to combine them into the velocity model I'm going to show on the next slide. So the first one was a Fibonacci spiral, 55 meter Fibonacci spiral. And that has a wavelength of about, the longest wavelength of about like 89 or so uh, meters. So that's a really good survey geometry. Fibonacci spirals are one of the most, from, from my experience, are one of the most uh, precise and accurate ways of collecting subsurface velocity information. Um, they have a really good 2D footprint, and each one of these dots here for both of these is an atom. So uh, this, this Fibonacci spiral has really good connections going across, right? All the atoms use, uh, they all create unique spacing. So there's not much of this, this spiral shape that's not, not covered by some spacing combination created by these atoms. So that's really important. You get a really good glimpse of the structure underneath when you cover that 2D area really thoroughly. So we first used that 55 meter Fibonacci spiral. And then we also laid out a grid here. So there is uh, two baseball fields, one there, one there. So we decided for the, the next survey, which was aiming to get about 50 to 300 meters in depth, we decided to just lay out a basic, roughly symmetrical square grid using 16 atoms. So that's what we did, and that resulted in some really good data. And since each atom has a GPS built in with an accuracy of about three to five meters, uh, no need to survey these. Uh, you can just rely on the natural or the, the built-in GPS signal, and that's plenty accurate and gives you really good results. So that's what we did for this large GPS grid. And the third survey, which isn't sewn, was spread out across the entire school, not just the baseball fields. And also we had some that went out into the neighborhood. Because if you want to collect data to a kilometer, well, you'll need to spread out your, you'll need to create an atom spacing that's a kilometer, um, kilometer wide, a kilometer apart or more. Um, the general rule of thumb is the distance between the atoms will give you the, the uh, a data point at that depth, but it's not perfect. It depends on the frequency response of the site. So you might need to uh, spread them out more than you think. I would recommend more like 150%. So if you want to get data to a kilometer, then you should probably have your maximum space be 1.5 kilometers. I've had data before though, where I had them, I had like a 5X multiplier. So I had really good low frequency response at one of the surveys I did, and I was able to get um, accurate data to much deeper than, um, than my actual maximum spacing. So it's, it's variable. So here's the velocity model for N18. And um, the first thing that pops out to me is this shear wave velocity inversion. So it's a really obvious anomaly here. It's about a 200 meter per second anomaly at 225 meters in depth below the surface and it's really really flat there's really no width on that thing so uh, at the very least it's a unique and anomalous feature and that could represent or be correlated to a hydrological change at that depth shear waves don't travel through water and if you were to have increased water saturation, uh, you'd expect shear wave velocity to go down as described by Gassman's theory. Uh, it could also be a, a unique low velocity zone. Um, that's certainly a possibility. It's very thin. There's a lot of things that this could be, but at the very least is a unique anomalous feature. Um, going back to the survey geometry and how you set up a deep VS survey, you can also set up these surveys, um, uh, like for example, a really 
A really uh, good way to do a deep VS survey is to lay out one long Fibonacci line going from uh, 0 to 150 meters because it scales really easily. Um, you have 34, 55 meters, 89, 144. I suggest you watch my Fibonacci uh, passive seismic webinar to better understand that. But you could lay out a Fibonacci line that goes from 0 to 150 meters roughly with less than 12 atoms. And then for survey two, you can lay out a large GPS shape. Uh, so you can spread them out, get your different spacings, make sure you create a spacing that's 100 meters long, make sure you create a 150 meter spacing, lots of overlap, and collect your data there. And you'll be collecting data for a deep VS survey for about 60 to 90 minutes. So anything less than uh, 100 meters, I like to collect for 40 minutes or so. And for any separation greater than 100 meters, then I like to collect for 60 minutes or more. So for a kilometer, 90 minutes is uh, recommended. The, the low frequency ambient micro tremors that we're collecting here, they, uh, it takes time to establish the, the correlations. So uh, the longer you record, the better. So this is our first anomaly. We're going to do a little bit of a, a case study here about why you might want to look and start to study deep VS data. Uh, and this is our first anomaly of interest here at 225 meters below the surface at N18D. And if we had just done a VS30 or a VS100, uh, 100 meters, we would have never caught that. We would be stuck up here in the record, right? But instead, we got data to 1,400 meters here at harvest. So some really, really beautiful data and it let, tells us a lot about the structure at that part of Napa. So we'll go to the next location, which is N22 Century Oaks. And this is a large, very large park in the center of Browns Valley. Browns Valley is a uh, elevated valley on the northwest side of Napa. Uh, and it's a really beautiful place. And we did a large uh, deep VS survey there with um, atoms spread out across the Century Oaks Park and also spread out across the neighborhood and the other parks in the area. There's a lot of parks there, so it made it, made it really easy to collect this data and we let them record for about 90 minutes. So we can see here, uh, this is probably alluvium in the, in the top 150 meters or so. And these are interpretations Certainly, though, different geologic layers, uh, understanding the volcanic history of Napa and also the uh, sedimentary systems at play, it's likely that these are layers of uh, more resistive and less resistive and less erosive rock. So probably a volcanic layer, sedimentary, and just this interbedded uh, volcanic and sedimentary layers, but uh, that's open to interpretation. But uh, the, the, the main interest is again we have this shear wave velocity inversion you can see the inflection point right there at 765 meters so it's similar in scale about 200 meters that it drops but it is much deeper now it's at 765 rather than 225 and we can also see that the shear wave velocity that it's uh invert that the inversion happens off of is higher too because before it was uh, lower um, over here, and now it's more in like the 1800 meters per second range. So um, if, if we hadn't collected data to 800 meters, and really if we hadn't collected data to 1200, this would have never been seen or well quantified. Um, most, most, most data collected is just a VS30, and you're stuck just way up here. So you can really pull out some beautiful geologic structure when you do these deep VS surveys. And off to the left here, this is the um, coherency plot for the longest wavelength captured, which was 1,178.8 meters. And you can see the coherency drops to zero, uh, more like at 0.8 hertz, but we do have good coherency in that 0.8. 2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 hertz range. So the Atom uses a two hertz sensor. Uh, it has the capability of using a lower 
uh, lower frequency sensor as well, but we find that with a two hertz sensor, uh, it's able to get some really, really good data, even down to like 0.2 hertz. So an order of magnitude less. So really powerful stuff, really great for this uh, deep shear wave uh, data collection. So let's take these two sites and draw a line between them and plot these anomalies. Um, one thing I'll quickly point out is that they're at different elevations, so uh, that needs to be taken into account when plotting these anomalies at depth, and then also uh, the elevation profile. So the line going through here slices right through Westwood Hills, which is a favorite hiking spot of mine, and it's really beautiful. And if you pull into the parking lot at Westwood Hills and just look out the, the door or get out, you'll see immediately a very, very large and very steep fault scarp that just rises up out of the, um, the valley floor, Browns Valley. So uh, there's faulting at the surface. It's about a 45 degree angle. I've hiked up it many times. It's really quite striking how sudden it is. It's completely flat ground and then it just immediately rises up. So we have faulting at the surface here right in line with our two anomalies, our two surveys. And we'll look at those now on a plot. Um, this is a southeast pro profile. And here is Browns Valley off to here on the, um, the left. And then we have Westwood Hills with the known faulting there. And on the right, we have the Napa River, so to the east. And here is our uh, shear wave anomaly for N22D, and that's right around a depth of negative uh, 700 meters. Um, and then we have our N18D shear wave anomaly at about 225 or so. And drawing a line between them, these, these, these anomalous features are very, very similar. So in the case of this um, case study, we're going to analyze them in relation to each other. So uh, drawing a line between them and then extending that line out actually puts us right in touch with the Napa River. Better understanding this low velocity zone found at depth is important because if this low velocity zone rises towards the surface like it does near the Napa River, and actually this is where most of the city of Napa, like the development is, then that can have a major impact on how an earthquake affects that site. Uh, a VS-30 maybe wouldn't actually capture that shear wave anomaly. Let's say the anomalous zone is sitting at 70 meters below the surface and you get a VS-30 and you think everything's fine. And then an earthquake hits and then, in fact, the geology underfoot um, is going to amplify any seismic waves and trap them potentially based on edge effect, for example. Uh, that could cause more damage than anticipated. So doing deep... Uh, shear wave velocity surveys is vital to understanding how um, an area will respond to earthquakes. So here's our VS-30 map of the city of Napa and you can see here this is all very low uh, shear wave velocities. This is an average shear wave velocity for the top 30 meters. You can see Browns Valley up here and you can begin seeing uh, some of the, the hills of Napa there on the side. This is Monticello Ridge, a volcanic ridge. I've uh, surveyed Monticello Ridge, I've hiked Monticello Ridge, and there's uh, rhyolite flows up there, brecciated tufts, a whole bunch of really volcanic resistive rocks. So it's no surprise that the shear wave velocity is higher in the 800 range. Um, what is surprising is this higher shear wave velocity structure here on the Napa River. N32 uh, was a survey I did where we split the atoms in half. So we had half the atoms on the west side of the river and half the atoms on the banks of the east side of the river. And they're right there at the water level. So this is uh, like it was muddy and it's, 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 it's um, very silty and very saturated. So these are, I mean... Um, it started even, the tide started coming in too at one point. So interestingly enough, this still is a higher shear wave velocity than some of the, uh, let's say, more 
stable and less saturated ground that we surveyed all throughout the city here. So um, there, there's clearly some sort of structure underneath uh, this area. And you can see it looks pretty related to the Monticello Ridge. Honestly, it looks like uh, it kind of extends down at depth. And you'll also see the Oxbow Bend in the Napa River there. The Napa River is fairly uh, straight. It's kind of meandering, but it really takes this big jog uh, downtown right there, right at this higher velocity section. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. This profile here is what we collected uh, with N22 up here, N18 down there, and this is the Napa River right there. So if we look at the uh, Oxbow Bend, we can start to understand potentially what that structure might be. And we can use HVSR to identify that structure or at least lend evidence as to what it is. So HVSR stands for horizontal over vertical spectral ratio. You can learn more about it with the video here. And that is uh, basically a measure of um, the horizontal over vertical like frequency response of a site. And we have a famous landmark in Napa called the Grape Crusher, which is right here. And that's a really nice park to take a picnic at and enjoy a sunny day in beautiful Napa Valley. And the Grape Crusher is situated on a classic Napa Valley volcanic hill. The east side of the Napa Valley in the city of Napa are these rolling volcanic hills. There's uh, grapevines planted all throughout them. People like the soil because it stresses the grapes and it's uh, very rocky and volcanic. And the Grape Crusher Hill is a classic example of that. And we have the HVSR plot for that in the green here. So we can see what the HVSR plot looks like for a volcanic hill. Now, uh, in the top left here, we can see the different, um, some of the different surveys for the Napa Valley Seismic Project. We have N1, N3, N5, right? So I created this, um, I took the surveys that bound and perimeter this Oxbow Bend for the Napa River, and I averaged those uh, HVSRs into a single plot, and you can see just how similar they are to N55, which is our iconic volcanic hill. So uh, this very likely, uh, there's some sort of volcanic structure underneath uh, the Oxbow Bend, and that's probably what's giving it its shape. So you can begin using the different measurements that you get with an atom to make these types of interpretations. Because the atom 3C uh, can be used, it'll collect HVSR data, because it has a three component geophone. Um, and it'll also collect all the information you need to process like Rayleigh waves and also love waves. If you have a whole bunch of Atom 3C, then you can do love wave analysis, Rayleigh wave analysis, and also HVSR. If you have a survey setup of 10 Atom 1Cs and a single Atom 3C, then you could do the Rayleigh wave analysis and also HVSR. Um, so I highly recommend Anyone that's interested in Atom also get a Atom 3C simply so they can also get some HVSR measurements at the same time they're collecting their normal passive seismic data. So with the understanding that there's a volcanic structure underneath the Oxbow Bend, or at least it's related, uh, and the Monticello Ridge here, which is a volcanic in nature, uh, we can zoom out a little bit and we can witness and see the Vaca Mountains here, which are very volcanic. And we can begin to see the caldera structure that's at play. Um, off to the left here are what's known as the Enchanted Hills or the Mayakamas. And these are a little more sedimentary, less volcanic, but overall the Napa Valley has this caldera or basin structure in effect. So uh, when there's an earthquake, we're going to expect that some of these seismic waves get trapped and amplified within the structures, the deep geologic structures present. So while a VS-30 measurement for a site might give you a really good idea of how a building will respond to an earthquake and how, how things will shake, and a HVSR 
plot will tell you maybe what peak frequencies um, you should be concerned about, what the specific resonance is. Uh, if you're not collecting deep VS data, you're not going to understand or even know some of the deeper structural uh, factors at play. So with this basin effect, you you Napa experiences uh, seismic energy to a stronger degree than it would otherwise. In 2000, there was a magnitude 5 earthquake. Uh, epicenter was Yountville to the north. And in uh, 2014, there was a magnitude 6 earthquake in Napa on the West Napa Fault. And it was around, uh, epicenter was to the south in the Napa Delta. And the, the magnitude 6 earthquake was very strong. It caused about a billion dollars worth of damage. The magnitude 5 earthquake knocked down chimneys and rattled a lot of people. Um, so even though the magnitude six earthquake is a strong earthquake, certainly, but it was the effect of it was much greater than anticipated. Um, it caused severe amounts of damage. A lot of buildings um, slipped off their foundation or they had irreparable damage. Uh, a lot of people woke up in the middle of the night to find their whole house in disarray, just everything on the ground, shelves, cabinets, um, everything just thrown about. Um, and whereas East Napa here, since this is more um, volcanic and uh, has a higher VS, uh, higher VS30 uh, information, well, there's just a higher uh, shear wave, average shear wave velocity for the top 30 meters in East Napa. Uh, some of those areas uh, had very little earthquake damage and they just felt a jolt rather than continuous amplified shaking. So it's really important that uh, we have uh, very large uh, VS30 data sets for areas that are at a high risk of earthquakes. And it's also very important that we have an understanding of the deeper structures at play so we can better quantify the risk to all the people that live there. So some geophysical and structural interpretations that we were able to make based off of some of the deep VS data we've collected in Napa. Um, and we'll start with saying that anomalous shear wave uh, decreases at depth indicate either increased water saturation or a shear zone or at the very least unique geologic features. So um, it's, we, we, the, the deep VS surveys captured these anomalies, whereas if you hadn't done them at all, you would just never know. So it's better to know there's an anomaly than, than it is not to know. We might not know exactly what it is, more data and more research is needed, but uh, you can start to uh, begin making interpretations and understand the area better as a result. Higher water saturation, lower shear wave velocity, in certain soil and rock types. So this shear wave velocity anomaly or in this low shear wave velocity zone could be related to increased water saturation. It is interesting that this uh, anomalous zone, if you were to extend it, goes to the river. So there could be a connection there, but ground flow, uh, groundwater flow is complicated. Um, it's altered by a lot of things. So we'll leave it uh, fairly free of interpretations there's evidence of volcanic geology underneath the, the city of Napa, specifically near downtown at the Oxbow Bend. And, and we have evidence that this volcanic geology is rising closer to the surface. So we know the Napa Valley and a lot of the Bay Area, a lot of California is volcanic in nature uh, due to the subduction zone that used to exist underneath um, that, that area. Um, and that, that, that geologic history still has an impact on our everyday lives uh, with an event, let's say, like an earthquake. That geologic uh, volcanic structure underneath Oxbow Bend, it's related to the Monticello Ridge and very likely the, the Vaca Mountains. And it's clear that a caldera and a basin structure in Napa are present and that earthquake activity is amplified in Napa and in the Napa Valley due to the basin edge effect. So we can see here in the uh, next map 
and 18 d is right there. This is the edge of the um, ed edge of the basin, for example. These these hills are fairly um, they they're gradual in their slope, but they do increase the Mayakamas. But you have the a, a strong fault running right here through Napa, uh, one trace of the West Napa Fault. So this area here is going to experience stronger shaking than, uh, let's say, like the east side of Napa. So it's important for everyone living there to understand that and to be prepared and to make sure that their structures or dwellings are properly uh, fortified or retrofitted or properly built because we want to avoid as much damage as possible and we want to avoid the loss of life. So if we wanted to test this, if we wanted to look further into these anomalous shear wave zones, then it's really easy to do so. We have N22 where we saw it at depth and we have N18 where we saw it, saw it shallower. So we could go to N38D, for example, which is at Alston Park, the survey geometry I showed early in the presentation. And N38D collected shear wave data to about 850 meters. If we were to uh, calculate using the slope of that uh, anomalous zone, calculate what the depth would be at N38D of, uh, of the potential anomaly, it would be about 950 meters. So if we wanted to test this, we would expand the footprint of the surveying uh, we'd, at Alston Park, and we would make sure to capture those, those larger wavelengths and we want to collect data in the 800 to 1500 meter range. You could also uh, go closer to the, the river, and that's actually what we would like to do here, is we would like to collect data closer to the river. I'll go back to that slide here, so that really is clear. And we would want to hopefully find that anomaly uh, shallower, so in the top 50 meters maybe, top 100 meters. So you could do some surveying in the neighborhoods uh, here and potentially catch that anomaly if it exists and that would be very important because the closer that anomalous zone gets to the surface the more earthquake activity is going to amplify in that area and potentially cause damage greater than expected and overall the risk might be higher than expected uh, as compared to just a standard VS30 map. So um, this anomalous zone doesn't necessarily just have to lie along this line either. It could be a, a different shape feature. So there's a lot of testing that needs to be done to investigate that further. Uh, the deep VS testing for the Napa Valley Sizer project will continue. And we do have other data sets throughout Napa, but we need to do a lot more in order to really quantify what's happening here. So. Thank you for watching this webinar. Uh, I appreciate your time. I hope you learned a lot. We have some other videos uh, on passive seismic methods. We have other videos on the atom seismograph. And next is also going to be how you can process deep VS data. So at the end of the clip, different recommended videos will pop up. I suggest that you watch some of those. Uh, I, I especially suggest that you watch the uh, survey geometries for passive seismic. Because if you're looking to get started with passive seismic methods, and that's the place to start, I go over some of the different survey geometries that exist, like a line, or an L shape, or a circle, or a Fibonacci spiral, and how they all compare to each other in terms of their, um, their accuracy. So that's a great webinar to watch as well. For more information on the Napa Valley Seismic Project, you can go to napaseismic.org. And if you have any specific questions for me, uh, you can contact me there. Uh, all the data shown in this webinar and also for the Napa Valley Seismic Project was collected using atom seismographs, both the one channel and the three channel. They're absolutely fantastic uh, seismographs, really, really great pieces of geophysical equipment. So I highly recommend them. I think they're awesome. I think every engineering firm should have a set of atoms and they're really easy to uh, split apart, break up, use their nodal, no spread cable required, and really they're a superior seismograph. Uh, all the data process was, um, all the data that I showed was processed using size imager surface wave, and you can learn more about that at sizeimager.com. And um, stay tuned for the next part where I process some deep VS data.
Thanks so much for watching. Again, my name is Stefan Burns. I'm a geophysicist with Geometrics. Thank you. Ciao.